Hello and welcome class. Dr. Billman here. We are continuing in our lecture series. Uh, we are again going through the third edition of Virgin Overby's Chemistry Atoms First. We are still in chapter one. Our chapter one is all about laying the foundation of chemistry. We uh, have been talking about basic definitions, uh, the more technical side of terms that colloquially just kind of get like interchanged and thrown around a lot, things like chemical reaction versus equation, atoms versus molecules, element versus compound versus mixture, uh, etc. So we've been laying out all of those technical definitions and in this part, our third part, now we're gonna be getting a little bit quantitative. So notice, and I haven't addressed this yet, but notice, the page uh, or the pages that we're going to be covering in the textbook with this section, this part of my lecture, um, are earlier than the previous lectures. And so, yes, I am actually aware that I'm going out of order of the text. Uh, and like, I, I wanna use this as kind of like a quick little side lesson of, you don't necessarily always have to go, right? Uh, in the order that is prescribed to you through a textbook like this. I mean, don't get me wrong, don't jump into the deep end before you know how to swim. But when it comes to chemistry and the way that I teach chemistry, uh, I am more of a big picture person. I like to understand like why I'm learning what I'm learning or emphasize why I'm teaching what I'm teaching. So I focused on the big picture concepts earlier uh, rather than later, so now we all, like, as I'm talking about the things, like atoms and molecules, we all know what I technically mean before we, as we are now, kind of narrowing the scope and getting down into the nitty gritty, there we go, details. So yeah, I like to focus on big picture content first, being able to understand the context again, for what I am talking about before getting into the nitty gritty details, which is what we're going to be doing now uh, as we shift the focus of our lecture as we lay the foundation to get a little bit more quantitative. Now we are going to be discussing not just what units we use to measure things in chemistry, but also to just emphasize like what is a unit and why do we care about it? Well, units of measurement, what are they? Like if we think uh, mathematically about units, uh, we tend to think like, especially at the gen chem level, we think back to like high school experiences of units being like, you know, meters, centimeters, uh, liters, whatever. And it's, it's just like a fine detail that when you're working through an algebra assignment, you're like, well, who cares? Like this is out of context. I don't need to have a unit. But what is a number without a unit? A number without a unit is just an abstraction. It doesn't actually mean anything anymore. Like, let's say you're going to the grocery store. This is you. You're gonna go on your way to the store. Let's say it's Kroger or whatever, you know, not a sponsor, duh. Um, so let's say you're going to the grocery store, you're going to the local Kroger and a friend of yours on the way asks like, oh, hey, you're going to the store. Like, would you mind picking me up 12? And you kind of look at them with a puzzled expression on your face and you're like, 12? 12 of what? What would you like me to pick up? Would you like me to get you 12 eggs? Would you like me to get you 12 donuts? Would you like me to get you 12 tacos? Like what What do, what do you want 12 of? And your friend just reassures you like, no, I just need 12. Right, so if you don't have a unit associated with a number, that number doesn't really mean anything. You don't know what you're supposed to pick up. Let's say you decide like, well, my friend just said 12, so I'll pick up 12 tacos. And it turns out they wanted to bake a cake later and they actually did want the eggs. You can't use tacos to bake a cake. I mean, I'm sure someone out there who's really good at baking could prove me wrong and make like a taco cake. But the point of this lesson right here is you need to have a unit on your number in order to actually convey something meaningful to another person. So that's why we care about units. All right, so in chemistry though, which units do we use? Well, we follow the International System of Standardized Units, also known as SI units. Uh, I am not going to try and pronounce how uh, you know we label the SI units in French, the reason why we call them SI units for, uh, like instead of IS units, because in an 
in English we say the international system of units, um, is because in French the S comes first, and they were the ones who actually organized this list, put this comprehensive list uh, of the most fundamental units um, that we can use to measure the physical world, like they were the ones who put this list together. All right, so in the third edition of this text that I'm using, uh, the units can be found in table 1.1. In the fourth edition, the table label might be a little bit different, but it should be nearby. All right, so the seven SI units, and again, this is a comprehensive list. Comprehensive list of all of the fundamental units that we can use to measure and record and report uh, aspects of the world around us. So the seven measurements that we can make that, again, are fundamental are mass, length, temperature, time, electrical current, luminous intensity, so how bright something is, and amount. All right, so the units that actually go along with these measurements, we can see like in the center column of this table, the SI unit for mass, for instance, is the kilogram. It is not a gram, it is a kilogram. Uh, and notice that that's the only SI unit that actually has some type of prefix like that. Everything else is straightforward, meter, kelvin, second, ampere, candela, and mole. So why is the kilogram special? Well, uh, the reason why we use kilogram instead of gram is that the kilogram is actually a little bit more like macroscopically tangible. Uh, the, like a kilogram is approximately the mass of like a tomato. Uh, so that's that's kind of what we're like wrapping our head around, right? It's something you can actually like hold in your hand um, and a gram is of course then a thousand times less massive than that. So we're keeping it kind of macroscopic. The meter uh, is, you know, the, a meter. It is approximately three feet since we are in America. Uh, I am American. We use the standardized uh, imperial units, which as a scientist, I find completely atrocious and I apologize to the international crowd for that, but nothing I can do about it. So we uh, must convert in our system from feet into the meter if we want to uh, like report our data internationally. Temperature, we use the Kelvin. This is the absolute scale, so there is an absolute zero. There is no such thing as a negative Kelvin unit. Uh, the second, you know, one Mississippi, that's a second. Uh, ampere and candela, uh, as well as mole, of course, then you get the idea. These are the units that are used to measure, uh, you know, these concepts respectively. All right, so which units are we going to be the most actively using in this class of this seven? We are going to be using mass, length, temperature, time we're going to be getting into a little bit more in the spring semester uh, as we discuss kinetics, but we're saving that conversation for a later date, and the mole. So we're going to be uh, discussing amounts of things. Uh, so notice as well that mass and amount, kilograms and moles, these are not the same thing. Mass has to do uh, with like the heft of the particles that make up a substance. The amount is like a counting number. How many of those particles do you have? So do you have 12 protons versus 12 electrons? The amount is the same, but the mass is going to be different. All right, so each of these units is a standardized metric unit. So again, this is the standard international system of units, which means everyone in the world, except for like three countries, uh, can use the metric prefixes to uh, either scale up or scale down what their measurements are. All right, so we, uh, you know, in America may or may not be familiar to a degree with like all of these prefixes, tera, giga, mega, kilo, hecto, deca, deci, centi, milli, micro, nano, and pico. Uh, again, in the textbook, uh, this table can be found somewhere around like 1.2. Uh, all right, so the Symbols uh, that go along with each of the metric prefixes are pretty straightforward. Um, some of them are capitalized, some of them are Greek, uh, but all of them are kind of like a one-to-one -one with the letters, um, you know, the first letter in the prefix itself. So like kilo is a K, hecto is an H, um, deca versus deci, there's an A at the end of the deca to make sure that it's clear which one you're working with. Same with like micro versus milli, instead of adding on another letter though, the micro is just the Greek letter M, mu. Uh, and each of the 
like, I guess, amounts that correspond to the prefix can be found in the next column over. So for instance, a terabyte or a TB is equal to one trillion bytes. So one terabyte is equal to one trillion or 10 to the 12th, if we're using scientific notation, bytes. All right, so the prefixes um, that we are going to be using the most frequently in this class uh, are going to be the kilo, the centi, milli, micro, nano, and pico. So of course we're focusing on like the small side since this is a chemistry class, uh, atoms are small, molecules are small, uh, the amounts of like volume that we use in lab tend to be pretty small. The kilo we will be referring to on occasion, uh, but not as frequently, let's say, as these lesser, lesser amounts down here. All right, so these metric prefixes, um, I, we're not gonna be like discussing basically any more from this point on. I am acknowledging that we will be using them. So if you haven't seen these before or you're less familiar with them, you might wanna work on studying what these are. I don't request or ask for like nearly any memorization in my class. Like memorization to me is like the bane of education. To memorize something means you're not actually learning it. You're just figuring out how to regurgitate it at a later date. But when it comes to the metric system, there's no other way around it really, uh, other than to like through experience, let yourself just get used to using the metric system. Um, but at this early stage in the game, since we're just gonna be jumping right into it, you might wanna spend some time trying uh, to like memorize at least these uh, ones that I've labeled here, kilo, centi, milli, micro, nano, and pico. All right, so we have our comprehensive list again of the seven standardized units. These are the SI units. There are no other foundational units. And you may have realized though that that list is not like a comprehensive list of every unit that exists, right? Like where, uh, for instance, are the volume units? Like where's the liter? Or where are the energy units, like the joule? And the reason why those were not on the standardized uh, like list of units is because all of those are what we call derived units. Um, these are units that are actually a combination of SI units. So we put one or more uh, of the SI units together and that's how we then create a unit that's going to represent this like other thing that we can measure. So for instance, volume is a derived unit. It is a quantity of three dimensional space, which means all you need to know in order to figure out volume is length in three different directions. If you know your length in the X dimension, if you know length in the Z dimension and length in the Y dimension, you can actually figure out what your volume is. So one of the like standard units uh, for, um, for volume is the meter cubed. There's also the liter, the cubic centimeter, the milliliter. There are plenty more that I haven't listed here, like the uh, gallon, pint, cup, right? We have like a ton of crazy imperial units for measuring volumes. But each of these is a derived unit, make no mistake. We can trace its way back uh, like in the most straightforward way in this meters cubed to see exactly and explicitly how this unit, this volume unit is derived from the SI units of length. All right, another example of a derived unit is that pertaining to density. All right, so density is the ratio of mass to volume. So we have this equation that we can use to calculate density, but even if you didn't have this equation, all you would need to do is look at the units to be able to predict exactly what quantities you need to know to figure out what the density of your substance is. If you know a mass in grams and a volume in milliliters, well, you take one divided by the other and boom, you have density in grams per milliliter. So the units will tell you exactly what equation you would need. And similarly, the equation is going to tell you how to represent your units once the calculation is finished. So these two things are gonna go hand in hand. All right, so let's look at an example of exactly that. Let's look at an example of taking, taking an equation, putting it together with the units in order to figure out exactly uh, what it is that we're being asked to find, which in this case is density in grams per centimeter cubed. So we were asked to find the density of a cube that has a mass 
of 2.69 times 10 to the fifth or to the five uh, grams. And it has an edge length of one meter. So this is a one meter by one meter by one meter cube or box. Uh, so this is like a three foot by three foot by three foot box. It's pretty big. And we might think then that this mass also is pretty massive. Um, but the real question here is not just like how massive is it or how big is it? It's what's the density, right? What is the ratio of this mass to this volume? All right, so we know what the equation to find density is. Density is equal to mass divided by volume. And specifically, the units that we are asked to find density in are grams per centimeter cubed. So this information is going to help us, right, lay out a breadcrumb trail, figure out exactly what it is we are trying to put together. So we need a mass and we need a volume and that mass needs to be in grams, that volume needs to be in centimeters, right? So if you've learned the like problem solving trick, uh, you know, from past experience of like organize what you know versus then afterwards, try and find what it is you're looking for. That's kind of the approach that we're going with here. We're kind of laying out everything that we know first. All right, so mass, again, we have uh, picked out or underlined here in the wording of the problem. Our mass, it appears, is already in grams. So when it comes to calculating density, since our mass needs to be in grams, it's as simple as taking that mass and putting it into the numerator of this equation. So 2.69 times 10 to the fifth grams. And we need to divide this by a volume that specifically is in centimeters cubed. Well, we can see in the wording of this problem, we're not explicitly given a volume, but we are given an edge length. And that edge length is in the unit of the meter. So there are two different ways that we can go about solving this problem. Either first, we can take our length, which is currently in meters, we can convert it into centimeters, and then we can cube it. So we can take our length cubed, which will give us a measurement of volume in centimeters cubed, or we can cube the length first, end up with something that uh, is again a length cubed, that's specifically in meters cubed, and then we could convert to centimeters cubed. So there are two different ways that we can go about this, but at the end of each of these branching paths, we're going to end up with a volume that is in centimeters cubed. All right, so the route that I am going to take is going to be the more complicated of these two, since, uh, like, if you can do, and this is more of a personal philosophy, but if together I can show you how to solve the more complicated problem, in theory, you will have the tools necessary to solve the more simple problem on your own. So what we're gonna do is focus on this second branching path. Again, the one that is slightly more difficult. It's not super difficult, but there tends to like, in solving the problem this way, be a like common mistake that is made. All right, so we are going to take our length and we are going to convert it into a volume. A length to volume calculation just means that we're taking our length and we are going to cube it. So our volume is length cubed and in order to solve for this volume, then all we need to do is take our 1.0 meters and cube it. Now, something that's really cool about units that maybe you've learned this, maybe you haven't, is we can treat units just like how we treat numbers. So this exponent, this cubed, we can distribute not only to the one, which we can, you know, that's normally what we see, you're distributing one number to another, but we also distribute it to the unit as well. So this exponent of three then means that we are working with a box that has a volume of 1.0 cubed meters cubed, which then simplifies to 1.0 meters cubed. All right, so this volume of 1.0 meters cubed, we could it, hypothetically, right, this is a volume, we could plug that into our density calculation, but we are not asked to find density in grams per meter cubed, we are asked to find density in grams per centimeters cubed. And so here, this second step is where some folks get tripped up. How do you convert meters cubed to centimeters cubed? Well, the way we do it, I'm gonna draw a line here, so we're gonna take our 1.0 meters cubed and we're going to have to convert each of these meters into a centimeter. In other words, this meter cubed, let's see, I actually 
a better way to illustrate this. Give me a second to grab my eraser and get rid of this line. Give me my pen back. Okay, good. All right, so 1.0 meters cubed is the equivalent of 1.0 meter times meter times meter, right? That's what it means to cube something. So in order to convert out of meters cubed and into centimeters cubed, we are going to have to convert each of these meters individually to the centimeter. So we're going to take the conversion of the meter to the centimeter, and we're going to talk more about uh, dimensional analysis in a little bit. So bear with me if you haven't seen this notation before, but we are going to convert one meter into the centimeter, and we're going to convert our second meter to the centimeter, and we're going to take our third meter, and we're also going to convert that into the centimeter. And there are 100 centimeters in every meter. If we go backwards, just to go backwards, we can see that exactly right here. Right, so there's one one hundredth of a centimeter in every meter. And if we invert that, another way to say it is there are 100 centimeters in every meter. All right, so we have converted our first meter, our second meter, and our third meter. And yes, anytime you have any type of unit that is squared or cubed or even the square root, you need to take that into account as you are converting your units. So we have to convert each of those meters in turn. And what this is going to give us then is a volume that is present in centimeters cubed. So numerically, we're going to take one times 100 times 100 times 100. What this gives us uh, is a volume that is 1 million centimeters cubed, or 10 to the sixth. So I'm going to include that now in my calculation for density up on top here. 2.69 times 10 to the fifth grams, all divided by 10 to the sixth centimeters cubed. All right, so now we're taking our mass, which again, we didn't have to do any conversions with, it was just straight up given to us. Our volume down below, we convert it into centimeters cubed, and now we can actually calculate the density by taking that mass and dividing it by that volume. Our density then becomes equal to 0 0.269 grams per centimeter cubed. All right, so we're working with these very large numbers, these large masses, or this large mass, this large volume, and at the end of the day, it turned into a density that was less than one. So as a, I guess like to, to give more of a real world grounding for this problem, if we were to take this box, despite the fact that it weighs a lot uh, and is also very large, it would actually float on the surface of water. It would float pretty readily because it is very, very light. It is less dense than water. All right. so. As always, this example problem is going to be extracted into a separate side video. So if you want to come back and see this calculation again later, maybe after uh, class or after we've talked about uh, setting up dimensional analysis kind of problems, unit conversion problems, feel free to do so. All right, so what, are, what other units are there that are derived units? Well, I've mentioned energy already, and I'm going to take this as a great opportunity to talk about the differences between temperature and energy. Yes, the two are related to one another, but they are not the same thing. So temperature measures the relative motion of molecules. It's how wiggly something is. Uh, this is a standard unit. This is an SI unit that is on that you know, table that we've previously introduced, uh, where the standard unit specifically is that of the Kelvin. That's why it's italicized here. But there are some other temperature units, uh, the um, like other common metric unit is the Celsius, uh, and the imperial unit, which we use in good old America, is the Fahrenheit. So we can interconvert between these units, but at the end of the day, what each of these tells us, again, is the relative motion of molecules, where the greater the temperature, the more motion, the lesser the temperature, the less motion. All right, energy is different than temperature in that, again, energy is the ability to do work. As energy is being transferred from one substance into another substance, the first substance that is transferring the energy has the pot or potential to either cause movement or fire or uh, some type of reaction other than fire to occur. Um, 
energy is what literally moves the world. So energy, because it is conceptually different than temperature, where temperature is literally just motion, it is limited to that definition. Energy includes uh, electricity, mechanical, uh, light, um, that is going to be what energy is. And because it is different than temperature, uh, we are going to have a different set of units for it. So the most common unit that we are going to be using in this class for energy is the joule. Now the joule is a, again, derived unit, so we can see explicitly in this breakdown exactly what standardized units go into the joule. The joule by definition is a kilogram times meter squared, all divided by seconds squared. All right, so why do we have different units though? Like, uh, I, I kind of jokingly said earlier, like, yeah, we in Amura could use Fahrenheit, but like Fahrenheit also, in my opinion, gets a lot of flack. Um, Fahrenheit is standardized not to water, which is what standard, you know, is for Celsius. Um, instead, it's relative to people. So that's what we're looking at here on this graph. We're looking at not only the uh, equations that we can use to interconvert between temperature, but we're also looking at what the purpose of the temperature units are. And the Fahrenheit was the first temperature unit, and it corresponded to people. Zero degrees Fahrenheit is really cold outside to a person. If you were to stand outside at zero degrees F, it would feel cold. It's livable, but it's cold. Uh, conversely, 100 degrees Fahrenheit is really hot outside. Um, and that's where we generally, like, you know, in the past it used to just actually be, like, generic, and then we kind of hammered down what zero and 100 in Fahrenheit technically mean, but that's where they got their start. Zero to 100 is all relative to a person in the unit of Fahrenheit versus Celsius, which is down below, or like in the, the middle bar, is all relative to water. So water was deemed as being more objective, uh, right? It's not people focused, it's chemical focused, it's water focused. And so zero degrees Celsius to us, right? So this is how it would feel to a person is fairly cold outside. Zero degrees Celsius is uh, equal to 32 degrees Fahrenheit, so we can handle lower temperatures than zero degrees Celsius. Um, however, the opposite end of the spectrum, 100 degrees Celsius uh, would kill a person. <laughs> 100 degrees Celsius is around, what is it, 212 um, degrees Fahrenheit? So yeah, it's easily like twice that of what a person would be able to handle before they die. Um, so yeah, the Celsius scale is used most commonly today and is seen as the more like objective and reasonable scale. But really, if we're trying to come up with a scale that is comprehensible to a person, Fahrenheit is going to be like the unit to use. Now, I'm not saying that this is an argument in favor of all imperial units. I just think that Fahrenheit uh, is a little bit more useful, let's say, than the gallon. All right, last but not least though, uh, we have the standard SI temperature unit, which is even more abstracted and quote-unquote objective than Celsius. The Kelvin unit is standardized to the atom. So zero degrees uh, in Kelvin, which Kelvin doesn't even function on degree, it's just zero K or zero Kelvin, which is down here, uh, is uh, equal to absolute zero. There is no molecular motion, no atomic motion, and of course to a person then that would kill us. Uh, the opposite end of the spectrum, 100 uh, Kelvin, is similarly infeasible for a person to exist or live at. Um, but the units um, pertain to the motion of atoms. So at 0 Kelvin, there is no motion. At 100 Kelvin, there's plenty of motion. All right, and this is how then... Uh, or this, I guess, is more of the like qualitative description for what the units mean. On the right hand side, then we can see the equations that can be used to interconvert between the units. So the temperature uh, or a temperature given in Fahrenheit can be found or interconverted with a temperature in Celsius uh, by using the equation given here. So temperature in Fahrenheit is equal to 1.8 times the temperature in Celsius added to 32. And yes, the reason we have to add to 32 is exactly because of this conversion right here. Zero degrees 
uh, Celsius if we were to plug zero degrees in right here. Obviously we would see then converts, since this cancels out, into a temperature in Fahrenheit equal to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, the Kelvin scale is set up relative to that of the uh, Celsius scale. So the way that we convert into Kelvin from Celsius is just by simply shifting the scale. We are going to add 273.15 to whatever our temperature is in Celsius, and that will give us a temperature in Kelvin. All right, so this brings us to our second example problem of the day. So again, I am gonna run through this example problem in the context of this lecture, but it will also be extracted. All right, so what we are looking for here, we are uh, given the boiling point of isopropyl alcohol, which isopropyl alcohol is rubbing alcohol. So you might even have this like, you know, in your cupboard, either uh, in your apartment, your dorm, at home. Um, it's a very, you know, common thing uh, that you can purchase at the store. So the boiling point of rubbing alcohol is 180.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, we are asked to calculate this boiling point in degrees Celsius and in Kelvin. So we can use each of these units uh, as a means to try and like understand uh, you know, like what 180.7 degrees means, like in, in the context of to a person, to water, and to atoms. So at 180.7 degrees Fahrenheit, this is definitely, right, greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit. This is hotter than what the average person, I would say also are a pretty arguable fair point, would be all people. No one would be able to handle 180.7 degrees Fahrenheit reasonably and live. So that's where we're looking at. The boiling point of isopropyl alcohol is very high, at least to a person. So we're going to take this temperature and we are going to first convert it into degrees Celsius. What would water think of the boiling point of isopropyl alcohol? All right, so to find this, we're gonna take the 180.7 degrees Fahrenheit. We are going to insert it into our equation where the temperature of Fahrenheit is. Let's see, just to write out the rest of the equation, uh, we are going to have to solve for the temperature in degrees Celsius. And of course there is an additional plus 32 in our equation. So let's take this 180.7 degrees Fahrenheit. And also, by the way, before we're just mindlessly solving this problem, I hope you've like paused the video to try this problem for yourself first, right? Brush off those algebra skills, try and solve for the degrees Celsius and Kelvin first, and then feel free to resume watching this video and check your work, see if you got it right or wrong. All right, did you pause the video? Have you unpaused the video? Welcome back if you actually paused, and if not, shame on you. Try this problem yourself. Do it. Try it. Okay, for real, we'll keep going though. All right, so let's insert our 180.7 degrees Fahrenheit in for temperature Fahrenheit. We'll just fill in the rest of the equation. It's equal to 1.8 times the temperature degree C plus 32. All right, so rules of algebra. How do we solve for our temperature in Celsius? Are we going to, because uh, right, we need to make sure that all numbers are on one side of the equation, we'll say the left-hand side, and our uh, temperature in Celsius should be on the right-hand side, isolated and alone. So there are two different things that we could do. Either first, divide by 1.8 or subtract by 32. One of those methods is right, and one of those methods is wrong, right? We have to, there is, a place to start algebraically, and it is subtracting by 32. Yes, we have to do this first. Otherwise, if we do not, if we try to divide by 1.8 first, we're actually going to end up with 32 divided by 1.8. And it's not to say that we couldn't do that. It's just normally if you divide by 1.8, you're not thinking about the leftover 1.8 that's still present on this 32. So it's just easier to subtract by 32 first, get it out of the way. And so on the left-hand side of this equation, we'll be left with a 148.7, and this will be equal to 1.8 times temperature in degrees Celsius. Now that the uh, temperature is isolated and alone, we can divide by that 1.8 on both sides. And this is going to give us a temperature in degrees Celsius that is equal to 
six degrees C. All right, again, we're dusting off those algebra skills. They're gonna be super useful to us for the rest of the semester. And hopefully if you attempted this problem, actually, as you should have done on your own, this is also the answer that you got. And if this is the answer that you did not get, hopefully by seeing my work, you kind of understand what went wrong. We can fix it for the future. All right, so the temperature in degrees Celsius gives us an idea for like from water's perspective, how hot this would feel. Now, if you were a water molecule, 82.6 degrees Celsius is gonna be like lukewarm, right? Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. That's the hottest temperature that water in its liquid form can handle. So the boiling point of isopropyl alcohol is no big deal to it. It'd be like the equivalent of us walking outside on like a 75, 80-ish degree day and being like, yeah, no, it's kind of warm, but it's doable. Like that's exactly what's kind of happening here, only from water's perspective. All right, we are asked though to also convert this boiling point into the units of Kelvin. So let's do that as well. Again, attempt this problem on your own. Our equation is going to be the temperature in Kelvin is equal to temperature in degrees Celsius added to 273.15. Hopefully, this is a calculation that won't take you too long, so feel free to pause, run that calculation quick, and then unpause. All right, now that the video is unpaused, all you need to do is take your temperature in degrees Celsius, insert it into our equation here. This is gonna give us an 82.6 degrees Celsius plus 273.15, which gives us a value equal to 355.76 Kelvin. Is this value greater than absolute zero? Yes, it is a number that is larger than zero. So what that means to an atom or a molecule is, yeah, there's, there's considerable motion here. And so all of the units are uh, telling us something similar, uh, just from different perspectives. All right, well, here we have our first example of some section review problems. If you are actually in my class, uh, again, these problems specifically correspond to the third edition. More than likely on Blackboard or in the future, whatever learning service we're using, uh, unless I've updated these slides in class, you'll be getting like the up-to-date real versions of what the suggested problems are. But if you're watching this recorded lecture, um, more than likely again on Blackboard or that learning service, what I'm gonna do is post what the section reviews, uh, like what problems I suggest doing to review the section. So these problems, again, if you are in my class, if you're not in my class, tune out, feel free. If you're in my class, these problems uh, are always suggested. They are never due. I never collect these problems. They are specifically uh, suggested for you to get some more practice doing the types of example problems that we covered in this lecture. If you are not a member of my class and you would like to find some more problems to work on, feel free to either ask uh, like your own teacher, your professor, um, do a quick Google search, um, like Khan Academy, Chegg, other sites or sources um, oftentimes have some pretty good like you know resources to work on simple problems like this to get some more experience. All right, if you have homework, do your homework. And uh, until further notice, class is dismissed. <laughs>